Okay, so today we're going to finish out, well, well, we'll begin the end, right? We'll begin the, the finishing out of the, the uh, statistical thermodynamics where we start calculating things like entropy and enthalpy and so on. We're just going to focus on the, the first three, the internal energy, the entropy, and the enthalpy uh, for this system. We're going to do a two-level system, and then we're going to um, do by hand a two-level system with degeneracy and then go ahead and calculate the equilibrium constant. So kind of uh, like a review of what um, you guys were asked to do, not this past Saturday, but the previous Saturday. So this is, again, the statistical thermodynamics connects everything to the quantum <clears throat> ideas, the quantum energy level diagram. And so we're really fo we'll be focusing on energy, entropy, and enthalpy uh, today. So if you can count the number of uh, energy levels, then this is the equation that you would use for the energy. And just to refresh your memory, let's see if I can find my pen. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So this piece right here is the probability of being in level I. So in terms of the, the expectation value for the energy, which is also the internal energy, it's just those individual energies times the probability of being in each state. Now this, of course, this piece right here is unitless. And so your energy units come from this piece right here. So whatever energy units you have in your energy level diagram, those are the final units that you're going to have. Now you may want to, you know, convert those. Uh, so just be mindful if you have, say, energy in wave numbers and you want to convert it to joules per mole and so on, you just use those physical constants, Planck's constant, speed of light, and uh, Boltzmann's constant to move those things around and change their units. So here, uh, here is U shag. Here are all the equations. And so once you have the, the partition function, then you can, in the energy level diagram, then you can calculate all of these things. Uh, if we were dealing with, uh, you know, high temperature limits or or the word equal partition and so on, you could use these terms for the for the internal energy. The, the one downside of going this route, and that it, that makes it difficult, and we will solve this problem later, is that, great, we could get the internal energy from these equations for, say, moles of molecules, but then when we go to calculate the entropy, we don't have the partition function. So at this point, I've only taught you how to calculate the partition function for, say, like a three-level system or whatever, where you can add up the Boltzmann factors for each of the states. Or a molecule, I've showed you how to do the translation, rotation, vibrational partition function for a molecule. Um, and so, uh, so it would be a little bit more difficult to find, you know, entropy, enthalpy, and all of that for, say, a gaseous molecule using these equations. You could easily get the internal energy, but then you would have to take into account that whole huge Gaussian equation for the, for the um, partition function. But it could be done. So we're going to start with the simplest systems, you know, just a three-level system here. And I went ahead and did this one in temperature because, remember, we were converting everything into temperature uh, for, like, the vibrational temperature and the rotational temperature. Remember talking about those things. And so there's a, there's a it's nice and simple to go ahead and write your energy um, equations or energy level diagram and just label the energy levels as if they were temperatures. Uh, essentially, the, what that does over here when you're calculating the Boltzmann factors, if I might pin, oops. When you're calculating the Boltzmann factors, notice how there's no, no little k in the bottom. Because if the energy levels are in temperatures, I don't need to... Um, like if I were to find the energy, I would multiply this temperature by, by uh, Boltzmann's constant, and then the temperature in the denominator would be multiplied by Boltzmann's constant. So we just got rid of Boltzmann's constant in the numerator and the denominator. 
So that's what you would do if you had something like a rotational temperature or a vibrational temperature. You just leave everything in temperature, and then inside the Boltzmann calculation, you just put the temperature over the temperature. So the temperature of the energy level is on top. Like you see this case right here, 25 Kelvin is on top right here. And 50 Kelvin is on top right here. Because those represent the energy's levels. Okay. And of course, zero is over here. So I picked an easy one. Uh, it says, consider a system of particles having three non-degenerate energy levels. <clears throat> So here's my question for you. If I had not drawn the energy level diagram, and I just put this on Blackboard, would you be able to draw the energy level diagram? So look at the, the words. Here's a system of particles having three non-degenerate energy levels. So I know I've got a three-level system separated by an energy that is equal to the value of kT at 25 Kelvin. So the ground stage is always zero. So we would come down here and always put... Uh, Where's my pen? Okay, it's over here. We'd always put the lowest level at zero, and then it says separated by energies here that are equal to 25 Kelvin. So here's the third level also separated by 25 Kelvin. So I just want to make sure, since I drew the energy level diagram for you, that you would be able to reproduce that. So then we calculate the partition function. Um, so it's a sum of three terms, one for each of the energy levels. And so we have the, the first term, second, and third term. So this is, um, since we're at, calculate the molecular partition function at 25 Kelvin. So that's the temperature that's in the denominator. If I'd have said room temperature, I would have put 298 Kelvin in there. Okay. And so that's uh, e, to the, e to the zero is one. So then uh, e to the 25 over 25, that's e to the minus one. And then e to the 50 over 25 is, is e to the minus two. So we add all those up and this is our partition function, 1.503. Pretty straightforward. Now with that, we can calculate all of the other things. So let's go ahead and calculate the internal energy. So this is the probability of being in the ground state. Let's, let's label these, uh, let's see. Looks like I label them zero, one, and two. So zero, one, and two. So this is the probability of being in the ground state. This is the probability of being in the first excited state, and this is the probability of being in the second excited state. And then I have the energies. Now, for energies, it says calculate uh, the molar internal energy. So I need energy per mole. So where am I going to get that? Well, I'm going to convert that temperature to energy. which is typically KT, right? That's, uh, KT is equal to joules, but RT is equal to joules per mole, right? Because R is joules per mole per Kelvin, right? And so we're, that's where the R came from, is I wanted that in energy, the molar energy, joules per mole. Uh, this one's easy, I don't have to multiply anything because the energy level is zero Kelvin, so it doesn't matter what you know, units on it, it's going to be zero. But this one I just wanted to show you. So this is the energy of, you know, uh, the gas constant times 25 Kelvin for, for this energy level. And then this is the gas constant times 50 Kelvin for this energy level here. So those are the three energies of those three levels. And then I just multiply by their probabilities. Okay. And so then it ends up being this... Um, I just did some algebra here just to save some time. And my end, ending, ending result is 88.3 joules per mole. Can we calculate those though? Just let's, let's just label them. So this is zero joules per mole. Can someone on their calculator calculate uh, 25 K 
Kelvin times 8.3145, so the gas constant joules per mole per Kelvin. So 25 times 8 is roughly 200, right? 207. Okay, 207 joules per mole Kelvin. And then this one up here will be 414. So I just want to point that out because that's our inner, those are our energy levels. And this is our average internal energy. So we're coming in at around 88.3. Does anybody find that strange? I mean, I just kind of want you to think about the numbers, right? So our average energy for this system is 88 joules per mole Kelvin. Or joules per mole, not joules per mole Kelvin, but joules per mole. If I have a box with these three energy levels inside and I have all my molecules or atoms populating those energy levels, and I reach into that box and I pull out one of those and look to see how much energy it has, I will never get one that has the energy of 88.3. What will I get most of the time? Zero. Yeah. Some of the time I'll get one that has 207 joules per mole. And very rarely, but maybe occasionally, I get a 414. And if I keep track, I pull out a bunch of zeros, and then I pull out a 207, and I write that down, and I pull out a 414, and I write that down, and I pull out another 207, write that down, and a bunch more zeros. And then I average all of the energies of every particle I pull out of that box, my average would be 88.3. So that's what we're talking about. It's the average energy of the system, even though individual particles all have a bunch of different energies. It's really strange. But it's not when you think of discrete things. Like, what does it mean that the, the average number of kids in a household is 2.3? <laughs> is there any household that has 0.3 of a kid running around? No. <laughs> but if you, if you average, and I don't know if that's the true average, but you, know, you, you get my point, you know, that no, no particle in that box has uh, an energy of 88.3, okay, because we're dealing with discrete energies. And it's just kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so the statistical entropy, so the entropy can be described in terms of the number of states that are available at a given temperature. And it was uh, developed, or I guess the statistical side of entropy was developed with Boltzmann, or by Boltzmann. And this is the equation on his uh, tombstone, so that's kind of cool. He had... Uh, Entropy equals K, which is Boltzmann's constant, log W, and W is a weighting factor, okay, for the different microstates. So what is a microstate? Well, think about our three-level system. I could put those particles in different energy levels, and uh, I could have all in the ground state, and there's only one way to make that. Does everybody agree with that? Statistically, there's only one way to make that system where all molecules are in the ground state. And there's only one way to make that system when they're all in the first state or all in state three. So those are unlikely in a statistical manner. If I have all of the, let's say I have 10 particles and one of those is in the first excited state, there's 10 ways to make that system because I could put each individual particle in there. And that's what this weighting factor is. It's the number of ways to make that system. Do you see how that, that's sort of related to entropy? It's the number of options you have to create that system. And that's what W is. And that, that is also uh, related to the partition function. So this, this, can be, this equation can be manipulated to where we end up with this bottom equation here. Um, we just ignore that that spare constant, and we just we just use this piece right here. I 
And so that's our statistical entropy that we're going to be used to calculating. But I just wanted to relate it to this W because that's the equation on Boltzmann's tombstone. There's Boltzmann in his younger years. There's his signature. Anyway, he's one of my heroes, I guess, from a scientific point of view, because he, in, in order to do this work on, on entropy, he was looking at the entropy of a gas, and that was in uh, 18, no, 1783, I think, when he wrote the paper on uh, statistical entropy of gas velocities. And that's where he said, just as a mathematical simplification, I'm going to treat these with discrete velocities, like there's only certain velocities that they could have. And he said, but this isn't a claim to reality. It's just because the math is simpler if we begin that way. So we kind of did a numerical analysis to simplify things. And you guys experienced that in Excel, you know, just, just the, you know, the, the integral is a sum and the derivative is the slope. It's really easy to do things in discrete level calculations. So that's what he did, and then that led to Planck using his, his mathematics to solve the black body radiation, and, and Einstein using Boltzmann's mathematics to solve the heat capacity problem. So Boltzmann was sort of the foundation of quantum mechanics, and so this is, uh, this is why I really like him. He was also one an, an early atomist. He believed in particles, and the current theory was no, that nature was continuous, that there weren't discrete particles. And, and so the, he, uh, he got harassed by, because he was one of the few that believed, it'd be like today not, not, not going with uh, the scientific consensus in any of the areas like climate change or something. It was that controversial for him to believe in atoms and everybody else said, you're ridiculous. You know, so it's, it's a good example where science is not done by consensus, right? Science follows the data and all it takes is one person to be right. <laughs> So, so here's the average entropy for this system. So we have our, we have our, uh, when, you know, once we get that partition function calculated, then it's really easy. We have our, our molar energy, the internal energy here that goes right there. We had the 1.503 for the partition function. We have the gas constant and the units that we want. We have the temperature in Kelvin. And so we just, you know, plug and chug. From this point forward, put the numbers in, multiply them through, and we end up with the entropy. Now look at the units on entropy. Since our our partition function is unitless, the natural log doesn't add any units to it. Then we have the units of the gas constant, joules per mole per Kelvin. So entropy, when it's used in all of these other subsequent equations, is always multiplied by temperature. So it has temperature in the denominator. So it's joules per mole for every degree Kelvin. So your entropy changes with temperature. If you increase the, the temperature, then, then that entropy has an imp impact for every degree. I kind of call it the entropy tax. You know, like the more temperature you have, the, the more entropy that, you, that you're having to, to pay. So that's our molar entropy. And then let's look at the average enthalpy. So consider a system of particles having three non-degenerate energy states, et cetera. So same kind of energy level system. We were able to calculate the, we were able to calculate the internal energy, U and S. And then once we have U, we can calculate the enthalpy. So here's U plus RT. So we have 88.3 joules per mole plus the gas constant times temperature. So here is our enthalpy. So just for grins, we're going to redo this problem just on a blank sheet of paper. And we're going to make some degenerate energy levels. So same kind of system, but we'll, we'll add in degeneracy. We'll look at how Q changes, how the energy changes, how the entropy changes. And then we'll look to see if it's endothermic or exothermic. And then we'll calculate the um, equilibrium constant using the partition functions. And so we'll see. We'll see that. It'll be nice. Okay. So let's do that on a blank sheet of paper. Let's, let's make the energy level diagram a little more interesting. So we have zero. Um, what degeneracy do you want for the first excited state? 
that y'all choose. Two, okay, so we'll do two here for 25 Kelvin. And what about the third? Austin, you pick. Three. Okay, good. Three. One, two, three. Okay, so I'll do this in table format just to show you a little different way to do it. So we have the energy, uh, we'll have the, the quantum numbers in, we'll do zero, one, and two. And uh, the energies were zero, 25 Kelvin, and 50 Kelvin. The degeneracies are one, two, and three. Is everybody good with that? All right. And then we calculate those Boltzmann factors, e to the minus epsilon i over kt. But everything's in temperature, right? So this is a e to the minus zero, e to the minus one, because it was uh, 25 Kelvin for the energy level divided by the 25 Kelvin of the temperature that we're at and e to the minus two when it's 50 over 25. If you're confused by that, go back earlier in the notes and see how we calculated the original partition function. So the only difference is this degeneracy piece. So Q is equal to the sum of all three of these pieces, right? G, I, E, epsilon over KT. So we need to add all three of those up. So somebody's going to have to do the little bit of calculator work. It's a race. I'll try to beat you guys. <laughs> Two point one four. You got it before me. You nodded your head, so that means you got it before me. So I lost. <laughs> Good job. Okay. So Q went up. We didn't change the temperature of the system. All we did was add degeneracy. And that makes sense, really, because there are more options for levels. And so it's, um, you know, that's going to increase our entropy. We'll see our entropy will increase. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate the probabilities of each. So this is 1 over 2.14. So 47%. Let's see. Do you get 34% on this next one? And then three. Chance on two. Chance on. Times and 19%. Are those the percentages that you got? And they add up to Pretty close to 100. Let's see. Yeah. So, checking my work. That's good. 
And so then we can uh, add up the internal energy is going to be the energy times these probabilities, and we add those up. So I'll just go ahead and do um, E I P I. So 0 0.47 times zero, that's easy to calculate. That's going to be zero. Um, so then we have uh, R times 25 Kelvin. So 8.3145. 25 times, and then 0.34 times 70.7. And then I have, let's see, R times 50, 10.19, 79, 78 point, yeah, 79.0. Is that what you get? Okay, so I end up with 149.7. So that right there is U. So we just did it in a table. We just took all our columns and multiplied across and and built our probabilities, then we times multiplied our probabilities times our energies, and we ended up with the, the various components of the energies from each level. And then our average energy is 149. Still remember that 25 Kelvin represents about 207 joules per mole. So we're still, you know, at this temperature below that um, at 149.7. But isn't it strange how all we did was add degeneracy and our average energy went up? Because statistically, there's going to be many more ways. Now, if I just have one, let's say I have 10 molecules or 10 particles, putting one in the excited state, now there's 20 ways to make that, that configuration instead of just 10. Remember before, with just a singly degenerate state, was only 10 ways to make that one particle excited, but now there's 20 ways. So its weighting factor went up, and all the weighting factors went up. And so we're gonna have a, a more diverse population of molecules, and with that comes the statistical probability that when I pull particles out of this box, I'm gonna get more particles with higher energies. So my average energy is gonna go up. So now let's calculate the the entropy. Well, first of all, we can do the problem. We can do the equilibrium constant right now. So the equilibrium constant. One of the ways to calculate that. Let me find my pen. Okay. So equals Q products over Q reactants. So we need to decide what the products are and what the reactants are. Can we make this the products? So this, let's just say that our two systems were in equilibrium with each other, and this piece, this energy level diagram here was the products. So does everybody understand what we're calculating? The one we had first was the reactants. And this is the products. And these two systems come into equilibrium with each other. So if I'm a reactant, I only have three levels with no degeneracy. And if I'm a product, I have three levels with degeneracy. And then we throw the particles at this box that now contains two types of buckets. <laughs> one bucket with no degeneracy and one bucket that has degeneracy. And that's a weird picture of nature. You know, we think in terms of nature coming together as reactants because that's what we do in the lab. We bring our reactants in and we mix them. But what nature then sees is two buckets, a bucket of products and a bucket of reactants, and statistically everything starts going. And when the temperature is no longer changing, then we're in thermal equilibrium and we're gonna have the population that we have.
of all of those. Now, if we were able to get in there and calculate the partition function for the products and the partition function for the reactants, we would get their relative populations and we would be able to calculate the equilibrium constant. So this one had a, a, um, a Q of 2.14. And the Q reactance was 1.50. Do you remember that? 1.503. So I get 1.4. So this favors the products. Let's calculate delta S. So we had to calculate S for the products. And that's U over T. I, I, have, I have to go back. Is it minus um, R lin Q or plus R lin Q? Plus? plus? OK, I just couldn't remember, and I didn't want to have to flip back. Okay, so we have 149.7 joules per mole divided by 25 Kelvin plus 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times the natural log of 2.14. Get 12.3. Okay, good. I like to see those nods when I do my calculation. <laughs> so entropy went up. So delta S, let's calculate that real quick. Delta S equals S products minus S reactants. So 12.3. Minus, what was 6.9? I'm trying to remember. Okay, 6.9. So 5.4 is delta S. So the entropy change was a plus 5.4 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay. That kind of makes sense. The products have more degeneracy, so the entropy went up. Okay. Now let's calculate delta H. Well, first we've got to calculate H products. Okay, so H products. And that was U plus RT or minus RT. Plus, okay. I just don't ever trust my memory. I always have to look it up, and I'm using you as my lookup table. Okay, so 149.7 joules per mole plus 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times the temperature 25 Kelvin. Okay, 357.6. All right, and then now delta H.
times. And what was the reactance enthalpy? 296. And what is our delta H? Plus. And so this, yeah, the plus minus is important. So plus what? 61.6. So this is kind of a neat situation, isn't it? So tell me how we would describe this reaction using terms that you learned in freshman chemistry. So what are some of the terms when we were describing reactions that you learned from the very beginning in your, as a scientist? Endothermic, yeah, it's endothermic. The delta H is positive for this reaction. So this is endothermic. So that's one of the ones I was looking for. So that's cool. And 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 yet it's is it spontaneous in the forward direction or not? Because it's endothermic. Typically exothermic reactions are spontaneous, but sometimes endothermic reactions are spontaneous. Um, so how would we know if this is spontaneous in the forward direction without calculating delta G? Can we look at the equilibrium constant? So what's the equilibrium constant? Is it greater than one or less than one? It's greater than one, so that means products are favored. So it is it's spontaneous in the forward direction. So this is one of those neat situations where it's endothermic, but it's spontaneous in the forward direction. So if we were to put um, you know, all of our molecules in as reactants and let this come to equilibrium, the system would get colder or you'd have to put heat in for it to come to thermal equilibrium. It would move in the forward direction. It would take in heat. It would be an endothermic reaction, but it would be spontaneous in the forward direction. Almost, well, I would say every situation where it's spontaneous in the forward direction and endothermic is when you have a huge increase in entropy. And so it's the entropy that's driving it forward because we have more degeneracy in the products than we have in the reactants. So we have, it's just statistics that's driving this reactor forward. It's not heat. Okay. So it's, uh, hopefully you enjoy that. <laughs> I enjoy that. <laughs> so that's where we're going to stop today. Um, we've, we've done quite a bit with just our two or three level systems. And next time we'll calculate the Gibbs energy and we'll calculate the equilibrium constant using the Gibbs energy and get the same answer. Okay. Thank you.